Well, you might have heard about this video coming up. This is video two for lesson A. Sound. Off we go. Okay, so suppose you were to throw a little rock into a pond, right? The waves from that disturbance would begin to spread out in a circular pattern as like we see here. And this pattern is pictured in this picture over here. So here's the source of the disturbance. And then each of these lines, these lines are called wave fronts, these circular lines, and they depict the crests of each of the waves as they move out from the source. So each of these wave fronts is uh, one wavelength apart. And these wave fronts spread out from the source uh, in a two-dimensional manner. Okay, so those, these types of waves are called circular waves. Circular waves are two-dimensional. A lot of the waves that we pay attention to are uh, spread out in three dimensions. Three-dimensional waves are called spherical waves. You can imagine them uh, spreading out in kind of like these uh, concentric spherical shells instead of concentric circles. The, those shells then are separated by a wavelength. Now, if you were a tiny little bug and you were, you know, fairly good distance away from the source and you saw these waves coming at you, you wouldn't be able to notice the curvature of those waves, right? They would look like it's coming at you in a, in a straight line. Think about the waves at the beach kind of thing. Now, for spherical waves, if you observe a spherical wave very far away from its source, the small piece of the wave front that you see is like a little patch on the surface of a very large sphere. If the radius of the sphere is large enough, you're not going to notice the curvature of that sphere, and that little patch appears like uh, the, the front of a plane. We call that a plane wave, right? So this here are plane waves here. They're just a large, there's a small section of a spherical wave that looks flat or can be depicted as flat. So as we move into talking about sound and then later light, just remember that sound is a spherical wave. Okay, so imagine you could take a two watt light bulb and hang it in a room so that it is the only source of light in that room. The light from that bulb would diffuse throughout the room and fill it up. If you then took that same bulb and used mirrors and lenses to capture that bulb's light and focus it on one spot on the wall, that focused light would appear much brighter. We would say that that focused light then is more intense than the diffuse light that goes in all directions. Similarly, a loudspeaker that beams its sound forward into a small area produces a louder sound in that area than a speaker of equal power that radiates sound in all directions. So quantities such as brightness and loudness depend not on the rate of energy transfer, not on the wattage or the power, but also on the area that receives that power. The terms brightness and loudness refer to a wave's intensity. In general, a wave's intensity decreases as the area on which it acts increases or if its power decreases, which means the, the intensity is directly proportional to power and indirectly proportional to the area up on, on which that wave acts. So sound from a loudspeaker speaker and, and light from a light bulb become less intense as you get further from the source, which is because spherical waves spread out and fill a larger volumes of space. So to conserve energy, the wave's amplitude has to decrease with increasing distance. Now, we can treat uh, this power, energy, and intensity idea quantitatively, but we're just re responsible only for a qualitative understanding of this stuff. So we're moving on. Okay, so sound is a longitudinal mechanical wave. It can travel through air, water, other liquids, solids, and gases. To hear sounds that travel through like a solid wall, and you put your ear to the wall and you hear the sounds on the other side. You hear sounds when you are, you're underwater, although not as well as in air. This is because our ears are set up to listening to sounds that move through the atmosphere. Okay, so sound requires a medium in order to transfer its energy. So when sound moves through the air, the disturbance which travels through that air is the compression of air molecules, okay? So the air molecules are squeezed together and pulled apart, making, meaning sound is a, a series of, of traveling high pressure and low pressure wave fronts. Those high pressure areas we call compressions and the low pressure areas we, find, we call rarefactions. And when we depict these, right, the wavelength then is the distance between uh, compressions or whatever you know point we're looking at. 
And sound waves are frequently graphed with pressure on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, which makes the wave look like a transverse wave, a sine wave shape on the graph. In this depiction, though, changes in pressure are, are being plotted versus time and not a depiction of the disturbance itself, which the disturbance itself is longitudinal, so you've got to keep that in mind. Now, the source of sound is simply something that vibrates. It could be an alarm clock or a voice or a speaker or something like that. The vibrating sound source collides with air molecules then, causing those air molecules to scrunch together and pull apart. Those scrunches uh, travel through the air, but the air molecules themselves do not physically travel across the room. They, they're just excited by that sound source and gain kinetic energy. They move outward spherically and have elastic collisions with other air molecules, which then gain energy and, and so on. And so here we can see, here, here's a wave source. They travel out. We can get the wave fronts as we get further and further away. Or rather, I'm seeing uh, uh, plane waves. Now, we can hear a lot about sound intensity and sound loudness. We hear a lot about this place right here uh, being a pretty loud place to be. Okay, so suppose you're, you're listening to one person singing and then nine more people join in. You will perceive the sound to be louder, but it won't be ten times louder, even though the intensity is ten times as great. In fact, you'll perceive the sound of ten people singing together to be approximately twice as loud as the sound of one person. If you add another 90 people to make a choir of 100 people, this will increase the intensity by another factor of 10, but it will seem to you only twice as loud as the 10-person ensemble, or four times as loud as the original soloist. Generally speaking, increasing the sound intensity by a factor of 10 results in an increase in perceived loudness by approximately a factor of 2. This allows for a wide range of intensities to be perceived by humans. The loudness of sound, then, is measured by a quantity we call the sound intensity level. And the scale that we use to measure it is a logarithmic scale that we call the decibel scale. So, the sound intensity level is measured in decibels. The sound intensity level increases by 10 decibels each time the actual intensity increases by a factor of 10. So, in terms of decibels, we say that the loudness of a sound doubles with each increase in the sound intensity level by 10 decibels. Now, like all waves, sound can undergo the Doppler effect. You've likely noticed that the pitch, say, in a, like an ambulance or fire truck siren, drops as it goes past you. A higher pitch suddenly becomes a lower pitch. This change in frequency, which is due to the motion of that ambulance, is called the Doppler effect. Now, in order to experience the Doppler effect, there has to be a relative motion between the sound source and the listener. Either the listener is stationary and the sound source is moving, like if you're standing on a platform and a train goes by, blowing, uh, blaring its whistle, or the, uh, the, the listener has to be moving uh, toward or away a uh, stationary sound source. Okay, so here's how the Doppler effect works. Imagine there's a bug floating motionless on the surface of a calm pond on a summer day. The bug, bored out of its little bug brain, is tapping the water with a pair of its little segmented legs, making a series of waves that radiate outward on the surface like ripples on a pond. The bug is, is producing traveling waves. The waves spread out in all directions, and the distance between each of those wave crests would be a wavelength. This wavelength is the same in all directions. It would look like this picture here. But now imagine that that bug starts swimming in one direction. Okay, it's still tapping its foot in its regular uh, frequency, but it's swimming now in one direction. That, then we're going to see a, a wave pattern that looks like this. So like this uh, wave front was produced when the bug was back here. And this wave front was produced when the bug was in a different position. And, and this wave front is produced when the bug is in this position back over here. This results in the wave front uh, being pushed closer together uh, in the direction that the bug is moving. Behind the bug, the waves are stretched further apart. The waves in front have a shorter wavelength. The waves to the back then have a longer wavelength. Since the speed of the wave is, a, is constant, and it's equal to the wavelength multiplied by the frequency, V equals F wavelength, 
then this means that the frequency of the waves traveling in front of the bug is higher. So we got a greater frequency up here than we do back here. The waves behind the bug then are lower in frequency. We call this frequency change the Doppler effect. It happens because the bug makes a wave and then swims after it so that when he makes the next wave, it's going to start out closer to the first wave and so on. As the waves travel to the rear then, it's, it's already further away from the first wave, so the wavelength is longer and the frequency is shorter. All the waves travel at the same speed, so they, they can't make up the difference. So then what happens if our, our little bug here swims at the same speed as the wave? Well, what happens is the bug is, is making a wave and then he's moving right along with it. So the bug is riding on top of that wave. The bug makes another wave and it's on top of the first and so on. The bug ends up riding this big, enormous wave up here uh, because of the wave crests are all in phase. They add up, which would be a, a tough little swim for the bug. But if he speeds up just a little bit more, he's going to be swimming faster than the waves. When he does that, he makes a wave and then he kind of swims through it into clear water and then he makes the next wave and so on. The bug is always in front of the waves in nice smooth water, shown here. The waves that propagate out behind the bug will have their crests in phase along a line to either side of the bug that trails back from the bug. They sort of over overlap. Uh, they're, they're, they will, what's called constructive interference, okay? They'll interfere constructively with each other and form a V-shaped bow wave. This bow wave will have a, a really large amplitude as it spreads out behind the buck. So boats and ships do this all the time. Even ducks traveling, swimming across the water, you can see them create this kind of bow wave. A lot of harbors then have speed limits for ships because the ships travel too fast or generate too large a bow wave that can damage property. So then, how does all of this relate to sound waves? Well, imagine two people sitting on a, a platform as a train goes by, and we've got one person here and one person here. As that train, uh, say the, the train is moving in uh, from left to right. Now, as the train moves towards somebody, the, the whistle sounds higher pitched, and then the train moves away from you, the whistle sounds lower pitched. Kind of like this. Now, the reason it does this is because of the Doppler effect. As the train approaches you, the wave crests are all bunched up in the direction that the train is moving and stretched out behind it. The distance between one crest and the next uh, is a wavelength. So the wavelength of a person standing in front of the train uh, measures less than the wavelength that would be emitted from the source than if the source were at rest. So in a similar way, the wavelength behind the source is larger. Now the Doppler effect can also be applied to light. All right, so the first thing to understand is that, that light, visible light, is, is really just a, a small part of a larger electromagnetic spectrum that goes from gamma rays to radio waves, okay? In fact, our, our, the visible light is it's really it's less than one millionth of one percent of the electromagnetic spectrum. So now if the source of light waves is receding from you, then the wavelength that you detect is longer than the wavelength emitted by the source. Because the wavelength is shifted toward the red end of the visible spectrum, the, the longer wavelength of light, then that effect is called redshift. And in a similar way, uh, the light you detect from a source moving away from you is called is blue shifted. Okay. Okay, so turning back to sound real quick. When when a sound source moves faster than the waves that it produces, right? So it moves faster than the speed of sound, that source outruns the waves it produces. This is like a, the bug on the water example. The, overlap, the amplitudes of the overlapping waves add up to produce a really large amplitude, which we call a shock wave. This shock wave travels along with the, the sound source, right? But if you're an observer, you're only going to see this kind of shock wave uh, from a, an airplane moving past the sound barrier uh, as it moves past you. All right, so that's our, our treatment for sound. Uh, we're going to, from here, move into uh, talking about uh, wave superposition and standing waves. See you in class.